So it's Greg Myroth uh, back here with Tony Olson. We're doing our second episode of Pottery Conversations. Hope you guys enjoyed episode one. Uh, Tony's a wealth of knowledge and we get sidetracked every once in a while. On this episode here today, we're going to try to talk a little bit more about marks, uh, dating, uh, date, at, at knowing the dates of productions of different UND pieces, some of the uh, trial glaze notations that you see. I know whenever I get a piece of UND and there's some weird marks on it, Tony's the person I reach out to say, hey, what the heck does this mean? Uh, there's like, and it'll be, hey, this is Hebron clay, or this is a trial glaze mark. So there's lots of stuff that Tony's able to uh, impart us with today. So with that, Tony, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about just sort of the the, bait, the typical bottom marks, again, kind of making this geared for the new collector that maybe doesn't know much about beyond just a typical stamp mark and just maybe even a little bit about some of the artist marks. And then I do want to talk about the date codes as well, because I think that's a an interesting thing. A lot of folks don't realize that that UND, kind of like Newcomb, like actually has a, a, a date code for uh, to, to determine when something was produced. So with that, uh, go ahead and start into this. Well, basically, the the um, no, well, most well-known mark is the University of North Dakota stamp. And that started, they started using that around 1913 and went all the way up to 1963. So on a piece of UND, if you look on the bottom here. Oh, yeah. Yep. All right. So that circular mark is the stamp. Okay. And um, again, they started using that in, in, in uh, 19, roughly 1913. I might be off a year or two. Okay. And they, and, but before 1913, they marked their stuff in script with just an ink. Um, it just says you and Andy. yeah, I've seen that. Like you, it, it looks like you actually uh, wrote it with a, a pen. Okay. Okay. So, um, so those were the earliest marks that I know of. So that's like pre 1913, but occasionally you'll see that in the teens, but this one actually, this mark, um, um, is used, uh, and I don't know why they stopped using it in 1963, but, but you know, Julie Matson retired in 1963. And um, so that might be part That's of That's what it. they said, right? Like when she retired, they stopped using that mark? Right. Yeah. So on that pot you just showed us, that there was that T672. Is that, is that like a trial glaze or what is that yeah, mark? So the T stands for trial glaze. Okay. Hold it okay. up just a bit more if you could. I couldn't quite, I couldn't, I couldn't quite see it. The T... Stands for a trial glaze. Hold it up a little bit higher. There you go. Okay. That's, yeah. And then the other mark. Um, what is uh, that mark? This six seven two. Yeah, yeah. That's um, the date. So that's your date code. Okay. That's your date code, but this is your date code by this specific potter. Artist. This yeah. is by Hildegard Fried. Yeah. Well, this dates to 1926. Okay. Okay. So actually, if you get the Miller book, which I recommend, everybody should have that dealer and collector life. And uh, you can write the university and they'll send you one for like $20. Okay. Okay. So they still sell them and they occasionally pop up on eBay. And I think they're in the uh, Ken Forrester book as well. Okay. Ken Forrester did a, a fantastic job at comparing North Dakota pottery to others. It was a comparative study that that he says, well, um, he compared UND to other potteries like Marblehead and Walrath and Newcomb yeah. and so on. That's and a then, great book. And then the other the other initials is um, HFD, which stands for Hildegard Fried De uh, Drebs. Okay. And she used to be Hildegard Fried, then she got married to one of the Professor there, whose name was Drebs. Okay, that gets you the D. What is that mark on the far D. left? What is that other mark? Yeah, that's her too. That's in that, she did the same thing only she incised it. Okay, so it's her initials. It's kind of goofy looking, but you can kind of see it. Oh, I got you. Okay, now you hold it that way. Now I can see it. Yeah, it looked like some. It looked oh. like an acorn or something. I thought that's a mark I've never seen before. Okay, so that's her. So now this is an example of her work, which I said, she never made a bad pot. That's a great pot. This is a great pot. 
I mean, that's and a piece of pottery that would rival Newcomb, honestly. Oh, it, it's incredible. First of all, the form is beautiful. Yeah. You know, it's a high glaze, but she had a steady artistic hand. This is all free and, and um, it's just an incredible vase. Now, um, UND collectors uh, really want her stuff. But the, like I said, there's not a lot of it out there. Now, this okay. is the only piece I have. Now, she also did just um, undecorated stuff and I've had a few of those but but that's um, the only piece of hers you have is that by choice or just because they actually just because I can't find it or really? I can't, yeah now she okay. did taller ones um there's some pictures of her work in um, um Ken Forrester's book um, I advise buying um to collectors buying every book on North Dakota pottery you can find yeah Ken Forrester, Donald Miller's of the cable years, um, Dakota Potteries, you know, uh, by Doreen Dummo. And, um, and of course, um, the American Art Pottery book, you know, is a fabulous book because then you can learn about all the other potteries as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but that's in general. Now, also on this pot, you'll see that the clay is white right okay now they their clay not until about 1939 did the clay turn uh they got a different source for their i mean a different i should say um a different mixture of clays okay because you know a lot of times they mix clay they got some clay from this area and another clay from that area and they mixed it to um to come up with a, a more suitable thing but anything that's white is is pre-1939 for the most part okay okay yeah it almost so, has like a porcelain look to it like a like a oh yeah porcelain. it really yeah. does yeah. yeah and you know they were great chemists you know um um Frida Louise Hammers was a great chemist I mean she was a, as much as a um you know, she just, she would mix and match. And, you know, she's the one that came up with the bentonite clays. Okay. And, uh, like I say, the bentonites, a good bentonite, uh, no other American art pottery can replicate a bentonite. good piece of uh, UND bentonite. Yeah. And I got a couple good ones. I saw, you know, of course, people, you know, one of your questions I saw on here is what's your favorite pot? Yeah. Well, favorite pot I sold. <laughs> I sent you a picture of it. Yeah. That uh, it was a bet night with bison surrounding it. It was by cable. So to me, it's the nicest piece I've ever owned. But you know, as a collector and a dealer, two things happen. You regret selling a lot of pots. Yeah. And you regret not buying a lot of pots. Yeah. yeah. So that's just the way it goes. When you're, when you got to do both, now, you know, selling pottery, Greg, is just like you. I mean, I bought my kids' computers for college by selling pottery. Yep. I replaced the roof on my house <laughs> before I sold it by selling a beautiful hand-carved um, gopher vase that was about eight inches. Yeah. And with the sale of just that, I was able to re-roof my house but i also bought each kid a car to go to college with a used car now all the kids they um they all work fast food in high school yeah fast food isn't going to buy you a car so right. that and that's how we you know that you know granted my my teaching salary came up a little bit but not much yeah. so dad dealing you and d pottery bought <laughs> bought some roofs and some cars well, that it did, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's just like you. I mean, that's yeah. your business help help you support your kids when you could. Yeah, yeah. But, well, it's funny you say that about like your favorite pots and stuff because there's I recently sold because I've been a Van Brigo collector, you know. So that's how I got started with pottery, and like I just sold uh, one of those bear vases, Van Brigo bear vases, and I I basically told the guy, I said, look, I'll sell this to you. You might have done this too. I said, I'll, I'll sell this to you, but when you want to sell it, you need to give me first option to buy it back. So and then I sold another really, really nice Van Briggle at the um, Grove Park Inn show back last month. I did the same thing there. So I was like, I, uh, 
good friend of mine was interested in buying this. I was kind of like, I kind of stayed away from him. Like, Man, I don't really want to sell this thing, but I wanted to have something nice there. And he kept yeah. looking at it. I thought, he's going to buy this vase. So when he came over and said, I want to buy the vase, I said, okay, on one condition, when you're ready to sell it, you'll let me have first shot at buying it back. So Yeah, see, I said the same thing to that that night that I, I sent you a picture of. I don't know if your guy can edit the picture of that vase into the... Yeah, yeah, I think we can. I'm going to try to for sure. But uh, when I sold it, um, I said, if you want to sell it back to me, I get first dibs. Yeah. And, that, and and it's the most I've ever gotten for a piece of UND. Yeah. Um, but it it's just, it has everything going for it. It's a Bentonite in 1932, 33, hand thrown by cable, which is the perfect, it was the perfect form, you know, and it had bison, which, of course, North Dakota is really known for bison. I taught in Jamestown, North Dakota, which is um, the Buffalo City. Oh, okay. world's largest buffalo there. Wow. You know? And so, I mean, buffalo have always been attractive to everybody in North Dakota. And um, so it had everything going for it. Hand-thrown, cable, you know. With bison and a, and yeah. they in their shaggy shaggy bison, yeah. which are super cool. Yeah, you know. And uh, I remember um, when I sold it, I you know I almost sold it a number of times. People wanted to buy it from me, but the guy I sold it to was a collector in North Dakota, a wonderful uh, guy who is never going anywhere. It'll be in his collection forever, and um, he appreciates it which is kind of nice. Yeah. He, yeah. Has a, he has an incredible collection. But I've sold, um, if I had kept all the really good pieces I've sold, um, I'd have the best collection in the country I've ever yeah. yeah. But I couldn't do that. But, you know, because you got to live. You know, you got to yeah. pay the bills. And that's how I did it. Well, it's kind of yeah. nice to be able to sort of be the trustee of something like that for a while and you pass it on to somebody else. And... Yeah, I, it doesn't bother me. I mean, you know, every now and then I see vases pop up that I've owned. Yeah. Okay. I used to, only, and you know, you'll get something. And I'll say, yeah, Greg, I used to own that. Yeah. 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 You know, and, um, and that's fine too, you know, but, but um, when you're a dealer and a collector, you got to expect that. Right. Right. It's just the way it is. Hey, so you mentioned you you talked briefly about the hand thrown pieces. So why don't we talk a little bit about the difference between, because uh, I know, I mean, I've seen some of these auction houses that'll say it's a molded piece and I'll say, look at this wonderful hand thrown piece. And I think, you know, maybe I think it'd be good for people, for your experienced collectors and, and new collectors to like get a better understanding of the difference between a hand thrown piece. I think what there was coiled UND, hand thrown UND, and by and far the most of it's molded UND. But like maybe speak a little bit about that and, and the sure. differences. Well, that's what they did. I mean, um, hand thrown is obvious. And then they decorate it. They use either Stafigo or or some other um, yeah. way of decorating, hand painted. Maybe they just painted it um, an underglaze or something like that. And then they they did use, you know, betonites. I'll just get a bet night. Now this bet night, which is really pretty, has got one of the purest glazes on it. This is hand thrown. And then um, it's, you know, usually from the thirties, this was uh, decorated by Huck. And um, it has two names. Um, one says, um, I can't even read it, but the other says Huck and then it's dated like 1933. That's a nice quality one too. The artwork's this really nice. It's not muddy and like like some of them are not that. Just well, this is good. pure. This is just pure. Now I remember when I bought it, um, I paid quite a bit for it. Then I sold it, and then it came up at auction, and I bought it again for half of what I bought it for. Isn't that funny? Yeah, and it's great, you know. And now I'm just going to keep it. Yeah. And this very road is a design, which is one of the most you know, bent knights, most bent knights are either hand thrown, hand built, or coiled. Yeah. Okay. Um, some of them are. Is that a, that's a hand thrown piece? This is a hand thrown piece. It's a very nice thrown base. It is. It's beautifully thrown. And the student's name on there is the one that threw it and then Huck decorated it. Okay. Huckfield decorated. So when you see two names and 
especially if you see Huck's name on it. Huck didn't throw pottery. Okay. She decorated pottery. And then this is my best piece of of Bentonite right now. And um, oh. this is by cable, hand thrown. Okay. Yeah. Decorated by cable. And now this this is as perfect a vase as you can wow. find in a Bentonite. I mean, there's not a bubble, there's not a miss, there's nothing. So this is uh, my favorite Bentonite because in its large, yeah. it must be three pounds. You how, know, how tall is that vase? This is, is um, and then you have um, Cable's name on the bottom. This is about seven and a half inches. Okay. Can you show us the marks on the bottom real quick? I'm just curious what it showed. Okay. And so the 820, is that a, is that a date code for cable? That's a, well, actually it's 1820. 1820? So that's the date code. And actually um, cable has a date code too, though. So there's two different date codes on here. Now there's a name, uh, Erickson is on here. So um, Erickson threw it. Okay. Cable um, painted it. So um um, and then just so I'm understanding, are you saying the, the 1820 is Cable's date code? So you could go to the well, date. That's, yeah, that's that's uh, uh, the date code. So a lot of times if you have two sets of numbers on there, mm -hmm. they both are the same date. Okay. So if you go in the book and you look under those, I just saw bubbles go up. Yeah, I don't know what that was about. No, that's all right. Yeah. Um, you know, this is a fabulous vase, but it's not as nice as the Bison vase, but and you know, these are, if you can find a good one, now there are a lot of crappy bet nights out there. Yeah, for sure. For one sure. thing UND did not do good, did not do well, I should say, is they all went down, Cable went down to um, San Ildefonso Pueblo and watched Maria Martinez make a pot. Now those are all coiled pots and then fired. And they're fired in, in you know, in pits. and with manure on and uh, but they all watched her coil a pot. Now, uh, Maria Martinez could make the most symmetrical piece of pottery of anybody in the world by coil, the coil method. Both her and Matson went down there and studied. They came back and none of them <laughs> knew a decent coil pot. I've never seen a coil pot that would match or even be close huh. to the um, women of San Ildefonso Pueblo. Okay. So, but they tried. You yeah. Know, they tried. And um, and they weren't afraid of it. Now, this pot I bought from you not too long ago that you overcharged me for. <laughs> that's uh, a, yes. Hey, that's a lovely bit night pot right there. Yeah, it is. And it's a coil <laughs> pot. It's a little misshapen and um, it's done by Matson. So but it's a coil pot, huh? How do you yeah. know it's a coil pot? It looks, it just looks hand thrown to me. Inside, it's all clumpy on the inside. They didn't smooth the inside. Oh. They, so it's all bumpy. Where on the outside, they smooth the outside. And usually when you smooth the outside, you do it with a polishing stone. Okay, you don't do it with your thumb. You do it with okay. a polishing stone. That's how the uh, women of uh, San Ildefonso and Santa Clara and all the other Pueblos did it. Okay. Whereas as, um, the women, when they came up here, if they got one that was pretty good, which this is pretty good, they didn't bother with the inside. Okay. okay. So that's good this, and that's a nice little one. And then another one is, this one is by Manson too. Now this is a, um, this is a uh, molded form. Okay. Well, this one's not hand thrown. This came out of a mold. But it's one that actually um, Julia Manson liked this mold. She made a little duck vase with this. You got, a, I think, a duck vase with that. Yeah. Same. Yeah. 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 But this is a bet night with, you know, deer and Christmas trees and stuff so like that. The so, bet night pieces are fairly hard to find, right? Like that. Well, oh, the good like, ones are. Yeah. There's a lot of turds out there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can, um, there's a lot that students did. Okay. And, and students just didn't do a very good job. You yeah. know, so just because it's Bentonite 
doesn't mean you should buy it. Yeah. You can tell a good one from a bad one. Yeah. Yeah. It's like any piece of pottery. You can tell a good one from a bad one. Yeah. Now here's um, a vase by Frida Louise Hammers. And it has oh. one of the prettiest glazes I've ever seen on a piece That's of That's a great vase. The great vase. It's early as 1928. And but this is all hand carved. And that, you know, that glaze hammers probably came up with. Yeah. Okay. And this is a molded piece. It's not hand thrown. But um it's a pleasing form. And I remember I bought it, you know, I bought it on eBay years ago when you first started on eBay, you had to dial in, you know. Yeah. And, and wait to get a connection. Yeah. With your dial-up modem, right? Your dial-up right. modem. Yeah. And and so you there were no guarantees. And so when you you I had a buddy who worked at the local cable company and I I asked him to bid on it for me because I was at school. Yeah. Well, he did that and I got it. I gave him that top price and it went for, you know, at the time, you know, this is probably over 20 years, you know, when AB first started. So by 97 or 98 or something like that. Yeah, exactly. So I ended up getting it, but it's still now this this um design is the um crocus, or they also call it the pasque flower. Pascal. That's yeah. my wife's favorite flower because they grew on the hills outside of Hebron on her farm. Oh. So anytime I can get a good crocus face, I buy it. Yeah. Okay. So this is by Hammers. Now again, Hammers was one of the best. Okay. Hey, and I, hey, I, I see another little pot back there, Tony, that you got from me that I thought was amazing. That bowl. Talk a little bit about what's what's on that bowl back there. Next oh, to those here. Yeah, that that's something I remember you got from me. I thought that was a great base. I didn't oh, have it, it for a long. Base. That's probably one. You know, I might have overcharged you on the bit night, but I feel like I probably was about half price on this one. So you probably would. Well, probably it's would one offer. of the few deals I've gotten from you <laughs> over the years. Now, this has a really interesting, at first I thought it was by Hammers. But when you look at it, um, and, and they got a whole series of numbers here. This is dated 1926. So it's an early piece. It's a high glaze. And it has a very unique, um, yeah. and this is carved. Yeah. What the floral design on it is carved. So at first I thought it was hammers. Then I looked carefully. And again, you see the T on there. Okay. Yes. Yep. So that means it's a test glaze. And then the numbers that came after are the date. And it's 1926. Yep. So this was done, decorated by Huck, uh, Flora Huckfield. Okay. Sister. Yep. And, um, but there's a whole series. Because it just says F H for Flora Huckfield. Now Hammer signed her pots two ways. One, she just put hammers on there, and the other she put F L H mm -hmm. uh, for Frida Louise Hammers. hammers I've seen both those. Yeah. So I remember one of the um, one of the uh, owners of a big auction house asked me how you can tell the difference, and I said the L. If it has an L in the middle of it, it's by Frida Louise Hammers. Okay. There's no L, it's Huck. Okay. For the most part. And so this is a beautiful, and then it has graduating colors on there, which is really hard to do. You know, That's, the yeah, shading I, in this pot is fabulous. I, th I thought that was a beautiful pot. It's one of those and ones I've- And it's a I've... chunky vase. Yeah, it's very cool. And, and, and it's it just, uh, now I'll show you, um, as long as we're talking about um, um, graduation of color, um, I have a pot here that NDS or UND. I always say NDSU because I was I went to NDSU. Yeah, yeah. But this vase here is one of the most pleasing forms I've ever had on a piece of UND. And look at the graduation of color on that. Yeah. First of all, it's a matte glaze. Yeah. But it shines. It just it's dated 1927. Okay. And it's done by a woman, by a, a student. So the vase itself is a molded vase. And they cable used this to do some, you know, amazing 
pieces carved and, and otherwise. But this vase has the best graduated color I've ever seen on a piece of that's, unique. That's an awesome vase too. And this is 1927. But um, I found, and years after I bought this, I found another by the same student. And it was a beautiful arts and crafts piece. And since then I've sold it. But um, well, yeah. hey, Tony, we're about out of time here. So like, yeah. why don't we, um, I mean, do we want, I know one thing we want to talk about is kind of good, better and best. And I think we yeah, sort of touched right. on, we've talked on some of that. So, I mean, do, what, do you want to just continue on for like another five minutes or so and go through that? Yeah, we can do that. Why don't we just do that? So, uh, you know, before we wrap up the second part of the series, one of the things that Tony, I wanted to touch base on is kind of the difference between defining what's what's good and good UND, better UND, and the best. And I think Tony's kind of talked on some of those things, but why don't we uh, delve in that a little more? I, you know, because I feel like you can find UND from a hundred bucks to twenty thousand dollars. It's all over the board, and I think you you hit you hit a few of the things that start to separate those pieces. But love to hear more about your thoughts on the difference between good, better, and best when it comes to UND pottery. Yeah, well, most people, um, when you look at a piece of art or a piece of pottery, um, if it doesn't look good, just go with it. That's, <laughs> That's a good point. If it doesn't look good, good. Just go with it. don't let the stamp on a piece of UND um, pers persuade you that it's better than it is. So a good piece of UND is the ones, um, now this, this is another crocus face that has an amazing glaze. Yeah. And it's early. It's probably 1926 or 27. And this is a very good vase. Okay. That is a very nice vase. You know, but I don't have any that are just, for example, there's a lot of the production stuff I would consider good. Yeah. None of it is better, right. you know, except for the, the Travois vase, the Duck Hunter vase, the right. um, Ox Card vase. There are certain production pieces and they're all molded, but some of the molds were awful um, in the production work. You know, the Why Not, Why Not vase came in really good molds yeah. and good glazes, and then it came in not so good. Yeah. You gotta be careful. And, and the mold oftentimes it just wasn't deep enough. You know, a lot of times on a molded piece, the, the name of the teacher cable is in the mold. Okay. She signed that. A lot of people think, well, cable signed this. Well, no, she didn't. It's in the mold. Yeah. Same with Matson. You'll see a Matson piece. Well, it, it's in the mold, you know. Now, Matson, we, it, you know, we've talked about her stuff, but Matson um, made some terrible pots just some awful pots that and i think she was just testing glazes and just took a for example literally took a thumbtack and pounded it into the pot i've had some of those they're just like yeah. what the heck is and, this and it's a pattern it, design so then she puts a glaze on it throws it in the kiln sees what it is puts it on the shelf and you know sells it for 50 cents but she also did, and I want to bring this up with Julia Matson. Um, Julia Matson was incredibly creative. Now, first of all, there's a kind of a thing that that cable somehow restricted the creativity of her students. Couldn't be farther from the truth. And Margaret Cable was incredibly um, um, generous and um, encouraging to her students to. Um, do things that were outside the area of just trying to sell stuff, which she yeah. was in charge of. But there is a line that um, Julia Matson did in the 1929 and 1928. And this is the 1929 vase. Now she was heavily oh. influenced. She was heavily influenced by the Bauhaus, you know, and modernism. She studied uh, Native American stuff. She did her thesis on Native American design. So she was all over the place. So is that like that little, I have a little fiddlehead, fiddlehead bowl that's in the same color scheme. Her as fiddlehead color. bowl is 1929. Same, same sort of. Same, that super cool vase. 
um, but it's it's kind of weeny. Yeah, very big. Uh, but and she, if you can find a vase like this, and I love this is my favorite Madsen stuff. That's a cool vase. Now, again, she did she did mid century modern stuff in the fifties, but this is nineteen twenty nine. Yeah, this is before she's doing the why not my not vase. Yeah, and I like the, that. That might be my favorite vase of what you've shown me so far. That's really and This cool. is another one. This is another 1928, 1929, Julia Matson. Okay. That's and wonderful. He, isn't that wonderful? Yeah. And uh, Matson was heavily influenced by all sorts of art movements, not just one. She's done arts and crafts tree vases. Yeah. For example, I'll, I'll show you a a tile by Julia Matson. I'll show you a couple of things as long as we're on Julia Matson. This is a tile by Julia Matson. Oh, wow. You see that? Yeah. Well, that's 1929, a dard hunter frame. So if you need something framed. Yeah, dard's the guy. You know, he's the guy. Now, isn't that a beautiful arts and crafts round? That's amazing, yeah. yeah. So she can do arts and crafts. She can do uh, modernism. Um, she can do Western. She can do Bentonites. She can do it all. And a nice, some art deco stuff, too. Really yeah, cool. Exactly. Not only that, but she was a kind, everything she's done, she was uh, a kind, uh, generous woman. Now, I got this. This is not the one I got from you, but I have two of oh, these. Oh, yeah. You got two of those, don't you? Now, she did awards tiles for the women at UND. Now, this is an archery award. That's okay. neat. It's an archery award dated 1930. And here's the back of it. Yeah. Did the one so did the one I that was there first, second, and third? Because you have two of them now, right? Yeah, I had I have second and third, and I can't remember if you sold me second or third. Yeah. But Eleanor Hart tied for second place in hits. Now she's doing this just so the women who are competing have something to take home. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now she didn't have to do that. Right. And she did that with other things. There's a recent one I saw sell on the internet of a um, a bowling person, a woman bowling, you know, award, you know, what place, et cetera. So I got that. second and third by different women, obviously. Yeah. So I'm looking for <laughs> hopefully the first place is still out there. The only difference between this one and the other and in third place is third place has orange shoes. Oh. Okay. But this is all hand painted, Greg. Yeah. You know, this is this is incredible. Very cool. It's very yeah, neat. She did, that for, she did that for uh, the women of the university. Yeah. I mean, how super cool is that? That's very so cool. This idea that cable somehow stifled her her um, students and her other teachers' um, creativity is a bunch of baloney sandwiches. Yeah, sounds like it. Sounds yeah, like it. and so uh, no, um, but again, you know, there are certain things that. Um, now here's another Matson. Now you, um, I bought this from you. I've owned about five of these, and every time I, I um, buy one, I sell it. Okay. But this I bought from you because I wanted to keep it. And it's not, I don't own it anymore. My grandson, Rohan, now oh. owns it. Spot. So this is Rohan Olson's first piece of his UND. His first piece of UND. Isn't that sweet? That's amazing. Course, his, his dad grew up in Jamestown, the, the Buffalo City. Yeah. So it's appropriate. Very that suitable. Rohan has this. Well, shout out to Rohan, the first, the, the youngest UND collector around. Yeah, he's he's eight months now. Yeah. So, and he got it at Christmas. So that would have congratulations been to you, Marilyn and Rohan, for having this first uh, piece of UND. Exactly. But you know, uh, Matson 
did some um, goofy things. I mean, she did some things that, to me, the the more, you know, the more, um, for example, this is the Julia Manson. Oh, wow. Isn't that super cool? Yeah, that is. It's a little vase. It's got birds along it. And I bought this. Um, and I, you know, there was more than me liking it. So that was unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I saw that and I just, I got to have it. She did Goofy Birds. Yeah. I showed you Goofy Bird by Julia Madsen. This is a very early vase. Can you see the birds on yeah. that? Yeah. This was 1926. So That's she crazy. was doing this kind of work in 1926. Yeah. Yeah. So, so all you got to do is look on the, you know, the, the University of North Dakota has a website where you can look at their collection. Okay. All you got to do is Google University of North Dakota Pottery. I'll, I'll try to put some link if we can on our little show notes from this or our interview notes from this. I'll try to put some links. Put a link on there for that. Put a link on my um, on my email. On there too. Yeah, yeah. And if people want to ask me a question, that's yeah, cool. yeah. This is a fabulous face. This is just a fabulous face. But um, so that this is better. This is you know when we're doing good, better, better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is extremely better. Now, yeah. of course, I wouldn't sell this. Um, so these are, um, uh, now the best are um, things like, this is the first arts and crafts vase I've ever owned. Oh, wow. Now this is uh, 1925. Okay. And um, as these arts, it's a big vase. It's nine and three quarter inches. Now in UND, and that's what you got to realize with big UND, UND, they didn't make big pots. I mean, if they did, they're very unique mm -hmm. and they're very expensive. So by and large, everything was kind of average to, you know, uh, but this is a student piece. So this is an example oh, of it is. how a student went above and beyond. And you see, you got the graduation of color, you got the um, arts and crafts design with the trees. And the funny thing about, I bought this, I would say 1997 when eBay first went on. Okay. They saw it on there. And um, before that, I had only seen one other and that was in Kurt Rustan's collection. And um, I left a bit of a thousand dollars, went to school and um, you know, then I, you know, I ran the weight room there. So I, I got home, at, I'd get home at 6.30. And then I found out that I'd won the bid for, for $780. Nice. $20 for shipping. Yeah. So 800 bucks. So they sent it and I was worried that, oh my God, they're going to, you know, you never know when you get something. Now this is 1925. Here's the mark. Okay. Sadie Reese. Anyways, so I got home and um, found out I got it. And then two weeks later, the pot arrives, beautifully packed, perfect condition. And I went, nice. It's your lottery day, man. That was my lottery day. So that this, doesn't happen every time on eBay, that's for sure. Oh, it never. It very so about seldom. three out of 10 times. If it's yeah, not, very seldom it's happens. not an issue. So. so this is my, and this is, you know, what I consider the best. And that bet night you have is the best piece I've ever owned. Yeah. This, um, this Lady Godiva vase is one of the best. That's, yeah. Um, another best would be. I was going to say, yeah, let's see that vase. I think that might be among the best too. This is this is better than the one I just showed you. Yeah, yeah, I really so, like that one. Margaret Cable owned a um, lake cab lake cabin on Lake Bemidji. Okay. And so she she um, not only was North Dakota um, very influential in her life, but so was the state of Minnesota. And you know she worked at handicraft handicraft guild in Minneapolis. So yeah. But um, so this is a perfect Minnesota lake scene. You got the pine trees, you got the smaller ones there and the color, the glaze on this. I love the color. It's extraordinary. And this is a big, this is almost 10 inches. Yeah. So that's a big vase. 
So let's say it's a molded vase, hand decorated. It's a molded vase and then hand decorated. Yeah. But that's hard to do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Getting this glaze this nice is hard to do. You know? Oh, and I believe this it. came out of South Carolina. You know, and that's what's interesting, Greg, is a lot of this stuff comes out, you know, like I say, North Dakota. I've never found anything like this in North Dakota. Yeah. Even even Kurt, you know, I mean, oh, did it sell it, originally in North Carolina, or did it did it go there out of the area right? By? I, who knows how it got there? Okay, who knows? I mean, it, could, it obviously it could have been a student brought it there. You know, at one time when the university was was um, you know kind of after Julia Matson, from what Grand Forks collectors tell me. They would take, they would have tables of pottery just sitting there for you to come and buy for five, ten dollars, you know. So they didn't rec this is before they recognized there was a value there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that's unfortunate, but you know, a lot of times it passed down during the, the through the generations. Now, what's amazing is, and this is another one of my best. Oh, yeah. Every, now you've seen this. That uh, every inch amazing. of this vase is carved. Every inch of that vase is carved. Every inch of this vase is carved. And it's a student piece from 1927. And it's about an eight inch vase. That's one of my favorite pieces right there. Oh, I, I, when I saw this, you know, it's funny um, how I got it. It was on eBay, so, and, but it was being sold out of Mandan, North Dakota. You remember the eBay stores? Yeah, yeah. Stuff into eBay. Mm -hmm. And um, so Marilyn and I drove to Mandan. Oh, a consignment thing is what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, it was a consignment. Oh, I remember thing. those. So we looked at the pot. Now, there's a little roughness on the bottom corner, but it was a great pot. Well, anyways, I misread um, the closing of the when it was going to close. So I thought it was going to close on a Sunday, but it closed on a Saturday. So I missed out. But it sold for you know good money. Yeah, and um, and then another one popped up at an East Coast auction. Okay. Exact same pot, exact same artist, exact same date, but it was like one inch taller. That pot sold for twelve thousand dollars. Oh my gosh! You know, and um, so I thought this was gone. Yeah. Well, five six years later. It appears on another auction, and I bought it, and I was tickled to get it. So that's yeah. amazing story. So that's amazing. But you know, there are so many pieces of the, the nice thing about U and D in general is that just when you think you've seen it all, yeah, something different comes along. Yeah, that's amazing. That's unique. Could be a student piece. Could be a teacher's piece. Yeah. I once um, was sent a, a photograph of a large bowl with Goldilocks and the three bears that circled the vase. And Goldilocks' hair ran the entire length around the vase. Okay, and the bears were in between. So it was kind of a three-peat. Coolest vase I, I've never ever heard. Seen. Never seen anything like that. Seen anything like it. I tried to buy it. I offered them, you know, retail, what I thought was retail at the time. Yeah. They were just looking for an appraisal, I guess. So yeah. And that's fine. But that vase is out there. But there are production vases. You know, there's a vase that's called the Lewis and Clark vase that was given um, that was given as a presentation gift to the great granddaughter of Mary Weather Lewis. Um and so that's out there somewhere. Yeah. See, there, there are vases that they made that we don't know where they are. You know, I've seen these old pictures of some of these uh, setups that um, Cable and Matson and so on did. And there are large arts and crafts vases on those tables. And where are somewhere. They? Yeah. Somewhere, you know. So hopefully they'll contact us. Yeah. Well, hey, Tony, I, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to do this with me. Um, we'll get this, we'll get these uploaded to the website soon. 
and yeah. I'll share some links and I'll get information out to you. And uh, I definitely, definitely encourage um, anybody listening to this, if you have any questions, you can reach out to Tony or I, and we'll have some links to some of the references that Tony mentioned on, the, on our uh, interview here today. And I just thank you very much for uh, taking the time to meet with us. And we'll do this again soon again. Yeah, All right. Yep. All right. Thanks. Thank you.